The Socialist Party was founded in 1996 and contests elections in both the North and South of Ireland. Internationally, the party is affiliated with the Trotskyist International Socialist Alternative. In the Republic, the party contests elections under the banner of Solidarity, formerly known as the Anti-Austerity Alliance, and is now part of the Solidarity People Before Profit group. Under the Solidarity banner, the Socialist Party holds one seat in Dáil Éireann and four seats at local government level. In this episode, I sat down with Ty Nolan to ask him what attracted him to socialist politics and the Socialist Party. Thanks again, Ty, for joining us. Uh, just first of all, on a personal level for you, what got you interested in politics? Yeah, I think like from a very young age, uh, I would have been interested in like following politics in the news, um, following what was going on, but like, I never really went any further than that. I never actually got active within anything. It was just sort of a an interesting thing to read about for me that I, I guess I really felt disconnected from. Um, And then really, like, I would have uh, moved to Dublin from the U.S. um, And really when I got here, I think one of the most striking things was, like, the the amount of homelessness in Dublin. And, like, simultaneously walking down the street and seeing, you know, people having to rough it uh, in horrible conditions. um, While at the same time seeing, like, the number of empty houses where they could potentially be housed if there was the political will to do so. so I, th- I think based on that, that, that kind of kick-started me doing a lot of research into, you know, trying to formulate my own views on things. Mm-hmm. And specifically, like, the more that I researched uh, the housing crisis here, as well as, like, like, it seems to be pretty much in every city around the world, there's some sort of housing crisis going on. Basically, I, s- I saw, like, two trends sort of emerging. On the one hand, there was, you know, reality faced by, you know, the majority of people, um, like ordinary working class people, where over the years they're seeing their rents rise, uh, you know, continuing to rise while their wages are continuing to go down, having to pay more and more of their income to rent, uh, you know, just to have that basic right of a place to live, um, constantly being under the threat of eviction by their landlords. Uh, and especially like with young people, like people of my age, just the the complete inability or lack of opportunity to move out of their home um, and try to, you know, find where where they can actually afford to rent. And then at the same time, I just saw this other trend that I think a lot of people are beginning to see where, you know, while all that suffering is going on, there's also an incredible amount of profit within the industry, particularly when you look at like, you know, the major real estate developers and landlords. Um, like just a couple of years ago, for example, uh, in Ireland, you know, while we're in the middle of this massive housing crisis, the the largest real estate developer in the state uh, would have doubled its profits to nearly like 120 million euro. So just thinking about like the level of extortion here, because like in order to make those profits, like in the housing industry, you, like your profits just come from continually raising rents on on tenants who, you know aren't able to afford it, uh, you know, are trying to raise a family and, you know, can't reasonably get by, like they have to sacrifice something just to be able to make rent every month. Um, so just seeing the amount of suffering that was purely caused by by greed, uh, you know, by corporations being uh, totally beholden to profits and basing all of their decisions on that. And then I think sort of from there, there might be the initial reaction of people where they say sort of a, uh, well, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, the landlords who are particularly bad or the real estate developers who are just particularly greedy, like as individuals. Um, what I found really is like under capitalism, I think uh, it's not so much that the individual is a bad person who is like a corporate executive making these decisions. It's because the system itself uh, requires them to continually, like, infinitely increase their profits which is just a, a completely unsustainable model and completely out of tune with the actual needs of people. Um, and I think really like this, these two trends can sort of be applied to pretty much everywhere. Like you look at like climate change, for example, and you see the same exact thing where clearly uh, there's a need for the majority of people to do something to combat climate change. Um, I mean, we look at the, the statistic that pops around at a lot of the climate strikes in Dublin is that it's it's just a hundred companies that produce something like 70% of global CO2 emissions. Um, 
So we know what the cause of it is, but nothing's ever actually being done to combat it or actually tr to address it at its root, uh, you know, address it systemically. Um, so yeah, I, I think from there, it just became very clear to me that capitalism just makes it necessary uh, or makes it so that the majority of the world has to like unnecessarily endure horrible conditions um, so that a very few people at the top can just hoard these obscene amounts of wealth that they can't reasonably spend in their lifetime. Uh, but the system compelled them to keep, you know, adding more and more wealth to themselves. Um, so yeah, I, I think from there, I started to develop a very anti-capitalist viewpoint, uh, which, which eventually led me uh, to see socialism as uh, a viable alternative to that system. Um, moving on also to that, you obviously are now a member of the Socialist Party in Ireland. One of the one of the questions I kind of get because you don't really see them that much, especially from my perspective, being a college student, you wouldn't see the Socialist Party on campus recruiting people. How did you come across them, and what made you think, okay, this is the party I'm going to join? Besides the reasons you listed before. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think from there, like, like I said, I started to really develop a very uh, anti-capitalist and socialist perspective. Um, really, from there, like. It's, it's hard to sort of see in that the potential for like positive change to happen, you know? Like it, it's like looking at the history of the world and just seeing, you know, we've known about climate change for decades and yet nothing's been done about it. Uh, there seems to be no political will to do so and there doesn't seem to be like the actual organizations in place in order to fix that sort of change. But still despite that, like I, I just, I think I really just felt like uh, I had no other choice but to try to get active and to try to get organized. Um, because like, you know, what else are we going to do? I reached out to uh, a lot of parties on the left. Um, and I talked to a lot of different people who, you know, were very nice, but they, they didn't really offer any answer to that question that I had of like, as to whether like this, the type of change they were talking about was actually possible. Um, and eventually I, I called the Socialist Party and I talked to a few of their members um, over the course of, I, I think, like a month or a month and a half, we continued to have like political discussions together. And what I found so different was that with them, there was a, a very good sense of like urgency uh, to affect change. And also important to me, there was a tremendous amount of optimism that wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just blind optimism, it was actually rooted in the material reality that like change actually was possible. Mm -hmm. So like I raised these questions, um, really the answers that I found that they had was that in order for this type of radical change, uh, you know, socialist change to actually be possible, it needs to be like rooted in young people and rooted in the working class that has a tremendous amount of power. So like the example of repeal was given to me, for example, um, where obviously for decades you had the Catholic Church uh, and conservative rule by two right-wing parties, you know, ruling over Ireland. And I think if you had, you know, said to somebody 20 years ago that abortion would be legal in Ireland, they would have thought they were crazy, you know? Like it was a completely radical change that happened just a few years ago. Um, but I mean, what you really saw was just an incredible amount of young people, particularly women, uh, coming out on a very large scale and importantly, like actually getting organized around the issue and beginning to demands. And I think something that really stuck out to me from the Socialist Party was that they weren't content to uh, just remain in the doll and give speeches within the doll. Um, they weren't content to just sort of like make statements online or just sort of take a passive approach and give passive support. They, actively tried to organize activists, uh, creating um, a socialist feminist organization that's like a sub-organization of the party still called ROSA to try to organize particularly young women and young LGBTQ people uh, around the issue of reproductive rights. Um, and also going further than I think what many parties were actually pushing for, like a lot of parties, even like genuinely progressive parties, were just pushing for the legalization of abortion and sort of stopping there and viewing it as we can't actually go any further than that. Like, it's just not the right time. We need to, you know, pick and choose our battles. But the Socialist Party went further and said there actually is the mood out there for pushing further demands and specifically pushing for uh, abortion access up to 12 weeks, um, which was of course one. So I think there, I really saw the, 
the actual material effects that the Socialist Party um, and the way that they organize and the program that they organize on actually can affect real change. And I think that's just sort of like repeal uh, was obviously a very huge thing. But I think um, looking back, we're going to sort of view it as like a, a stepping stone for many young people uh, get beginning to get active in politics and beginning to realize just how much power they hold. So you mentioned the Socialist Party continually trying to push even after the abortion referendum where some other parties mightn't have gone that far, that extra step. Um, is there any aspect in particular with the party that has kept you involved to date? I think generally, because what I've like, what I've found uh, since I've been like politically active is that like there can be a certain sense of people where it feels like uh, a movement rises up and there's a tremendous amount of potential and then nothing really comes from it and it sort of dies off. Like I, I think we saw that with uh, say the climate strikes that happened like a year or so ago. Um, even I think you could point towards like like Black Lives Matter, for example, I think is a very good example where you had very active uh, protests happening in 2012 and 2015, and then for a number of years, seemingly nothing. Um, however, the effect that like those initial protests had was sort of festering underneath that like now that, you know, tragically with the death of George Floyd that reignited the movement, we're seeing uh, a much stronger movement come out of it, a very multiracial, very like young and working class led movement um that's pushing much further than it had before so i think what's kept me involved hasn't necessarily been um one particular issue it has generally been like the fact that like i, I feel like now because of like guidance from like you know more experienced members of the socialist party and just my own experience now getting involved in campaigns and getting involved in organizing it's becoming more clear that uh there can begin to become a snowball effect where young people and working class people make a major victory with repeal and it gives them the confidence moving forward to try to enact further change in, in different areas such as Black Lives Matter, such as the housing movement, etc. Um, so I think generally what's kept me going is trying to build the party um, specifically because I think it is so important for us to actually get organized and go that step further than just like, you know, being active and going to protests. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's really what's kept me involved. Mm -hmm. Um, talking a little bit then on obviously the two most recent big referendums that we've had in Ireland were the marriage equality referendum in 2015 and the repeal of the 8th in 2018. Um, we talked a little bit about the climate strikes and Black Lives Matter. Do you think that there's any real core um, ideal or push for change that can reunite young people again under one banner as opposed to being split by parties? Um, I mean, yeah, I think... Like we've seen it with a lot of issues. Uh, like I pretty much all the issues I've named there have been uh, like, for example, we just saw like it wasn't too long ago um, where thousands of people uh, who, you know, were maybe affiliated with different parties or different organizations or completely unaffiliated coming out in the midst of a lockdown, uh, you know, and protesting for Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, Really, I, I think that there's just a very strong appetite for particularly young people right now to get involved in really any sort of progressive politics. I think really importantly, what we need to stress is um, it can hurt a movement, I think, if we sort of take a, an approach of like, we don't actually need to organize under a single program, that we actually don't need like a very clear direction moving forward. Um, so I think really like, for example, coming out of Black Lives Matter, I think it's very important that people see that as an opportunity for us to actually build anti-racist organizations that have a very clear, uh, you know, radical progressive agenda, uh, actually pushing for demands um, and sort of taking an approach that you might see amongst very genuine people of saying like, this isn't a political issue, uh, you know, um, I think it, it might be sort of almost like ignoring the reality of like there are many issues where political parties take a, a hostile stance towards progressive change. Um, like again, I guess bringing it back to climate change, for example, there are parties who are actively working uh, to prevent solutions for climate change from being enacted. 
um, and we shouldn't like have any sort of illusions that we you know can't be critical of them or we can't make it political because it is very clearly a political issue in my opinion but yeah I, I think there's there's just a lot of issues like Black Lives Matter like climate uh, climate justice like the housing issue um, that are really pushing young people to get involved regardless of where they're coming from politically at the moment yeah and um, from your perspective um, and I know it's something a lot of the left-wing parties seem to have a consensus on but I'd, I'd particularly interested to ask you because um, all the other parties I've interviewed prior to this probably wouldn't have been as left-leaning as the Socialist Party but in regards to say politicians listening to younger people and actively uh, taking an interest in what they have to say do you think that it's getting uh, better or do you think it's just staying the same or do you even think it might be getting worse? Uh, in terms of the parties actually listening to young people, I, I think that young people have sort of forced parties to begin taking notice of them and the issues that, you know, are important to them. Um, sometimes I think they can try to sort of tiptoe around the issue. Like I think recently, like I guess again bringing up the example of climate change, uh, or very clearly, I, I think when I'm talking to people, the general attitude is that there's a full understanding that, uh, you know, paying attention to our individual consumption methods uh, or, you know, um, everybody riding a bicycle to work isn't the large scale uh, change that we need to see to actually make a difference to combat climate change. Um, like I said, like when the reality is 100 corporations are responsible for 70% of emissions, any uh, any sort of reform that ignores that reality is dealing with the root of the issue. So like, I guess we saw recently with like the Green Party say where they put forward the the idea of, um, you know, putting a ban on like two on one meal deals as if that's actually going to have any sort of large scale impact on climate change in general. However, like just the fact that parties are beginning to have to sort of like make those false concessions, I think is very significant and shows the impact that young people getting organized, uh, going out and protesting, having the, the Friday for Futures and climate strikes, um, you know, a year or so ago has actually had on these parties. I think really crucial, like if young people want uh, to have their voices heard within a political party, it's important to actually take note of like the internal structures of that party itself to see if, you know, like, because the politicians at the top, the leaders of the party may be very well-meaning, may be very genuine people. Um, but if the internal structures of the party don't actually allow young people to have their voices heard, it's inevitably going to fall on deaf ears. So I think we're talking about organizing, building new parties, organizations, etc., we need to make sure that there are democratic structures where every single member, regardless of if they're 16 or 65, uh, has the right to raise issues and differences with the party, uh, has the ability to say, I don't think we're focusing enough on this issue right now. And for the party leadership or party leadership committees, whatever it may be, actually be held accountable to making sure that they're listening uh, to those concerns. Mm -hmm. um one thing that just kind of comes to mind and it's something i'd like to touch on with you um recently especially over the pandemic we've seen um an awful rise in far-right movement especially from the national party and the Brexit freedom party in regards to uh, wearing a mask or even in some cases targeting uh, ministers of the gov current government uh, do you feel that the left-wing parties are ad adequately um What's the word I'm looking for? Or do you think they have the sufficient resources to uh, combat the incoming threat from the right-wing parties at the moment? Yeah, no, it's definitely a worrying um, development. I think importantly, the analysis that we need to take, I guess like sort of the reality of what those right-wing protests are. Um, because of course, like we just recently had the election where far-right parties were uh, you know, pretty handily defeated in the elections they ran in. However, you know, while that election was going on, we had no idea that we'd be entering into, uh, you know, such an extreme economic recession where many people are feeling left behind, understandably, by the government, uh, where many people are, you know, growing frustrated. And I think it's like those sort of conditions that 
begin to make people open to conspiracy ideas uh, such as like, you know, we can't trust vaccines, um, you know, being anti-mask and so on. Importantly, still within those movements is there is a very, there is a very violent uh, core, like a small base, I would say, compared to what the larger uh, mood within those rallies are. I think a lot of people understandably may be seeing those rallies, which are off-branded as, um, you know, anti-corruption, which of course you see like what happened with the Gulfgate scan with the government. And it's understandable why people would see a protest against government corruption and say, well, of course I agree with that. It's ridiculous that uh, government ministers were going off breaking their own rules while I have to, uh, you know, obey them. Um, you know, one rules for one group of people and one rule for the other. So I think it's important that we don't paint them all in the, in the same uh, brush, I guess, and say that everybody attending these protests um, are beyond reasoning with, uh, that they are all far right or they are all fascist by any means. I think importantly for the left right now is that we need to take an approach of trying to build our own forces because more often than not, when far right parties are actually able to rise is when there is an absence of a strong and militant left within a country. Um, so taking an approach of, say, trying to go in small groups and, and combating the far right, um, it's incredibly noble. I understand why people do it. Uh, and I don't like personally criticize anybody for doing it because it's obviously very uh, frightening to see some of the messages being put forward. But really our focus right now needs to be building a strong and militant left, uh, fighting on socialist program that can actually win over a lot of these people uh, and can actually, you know, I think, have a very good chance of uh, defeating the far right movement in this moment. Um, and finally, my last question for you is, where do you see yourself uh, going in the future of youth politics and politics as a whole? Um, I think for myself, like really, I think especially with what we're seeing, you know, in this insane year with with uh, the COVID crisis, with the economic recession, and just generally before this, there's been a massive change in mood that we, like I haven't seen in my lifetime, even though I'm quite young, uh, and even older people within the Socialist Party talk to, saying that they haven't seen this amount of potential to grow, uh, you know, in their lifetimes either. So I think this next decade, this next decade, like the 2020s, is going to be a very significant time uh, and period for more young people and working class people uh, to begin to get organized, um, to really draw anti-capitalist conclusions from this moment and realize that, like, again, that they actually do have the power to affect the sort of socialist change that is incredibly needed in this time. I see myself as, you know, continuing to be a part of that movement. Um, like, I, I, I don't think, like, I, I'm always skeptical when I hear, um, especially people like around my age sort of have like careerist attitudes towards politics, which again, I think might genuinely come from a sense of, you know, believing that uh, getting into an elected position in the doll is the most effective way to make change. I think the reality is, is that running candidates in the doll um, or running in local elections or European elections is a very useful tool for the left in order to expose the system for what it is, to hold the government to account, uh, to spread our message as well as um, to actually, you know, win some, you know, material gains for working class and young people. Uh, but I think generally if people are looking um, to get involved in politics in the future, especially young people, you need to start looking at how can you get organized with grassroots, uh, democratically organized socialist organizations such as the Socialist Party. Perfect. Ty, thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.